And today I'm going to talk to you about AI and skills-based hiring, probably uh, two of the biggest trends that many of you uh, will be thinking about and certainly be hearing about. So a little bit of background before I, I go into uh, talking about AI and skills-based hiring about Artichore. So I set it up 10 years ago, and my objective when I set up the company was really to uncover potential. Because I felt that what we needed to try and find out about people were sometimes things that they didn't even know that they were capable of. And, and as part of that sort of mission to uncover potential, I then realised that actually one of the big things that we had to do was scrap the CV. And, and that has been a big campaign of mine. And just quickly, on that topic of the CV, how many people in this room use C CV as part of your selection criteria? I expected 100%. So there you go. We all use the CV, it's our comfort blanket, and we feel happy with it. Now, same question, different question, but same topic. How many of you distrust some of the information that you see in a CV? A hundred percent. Now, if I said to you, oh, uh, how many of you use a car? And you uh, 100% put your hand up in a car. And then I said, how many of you distrust that the car will get you safely to your journey and you all stuck up your hands? You would think we were completely mad. And that is exactly where we are with the CV. And that's why I think actually we're at a point in time now where the life of the CV is coming to its end. And I'll, I'll share a bit more about that. But Arctic Shores and our, our mission to get rid of, get rid of the CV and, and uncover potential, we've worked with 350 organisations, we've screened more than 3 million candidates in 45 different countries, and this is the bit that I'm most proud about. We've helped 50,000 what I call uncovered potentials get great jobs at great companies. So, on to the topic for today. I'm going to cover three things. First. What is the big promise of skills-based hiring? Why is everybody talking about it? Why does there seem to be so much stuff in LinkedIn and all the other things that are coming into your inbox talking about this is the great new thing that's going to turn your jobs around and make life super easy? I'm then going to share with you why I actually think AI is going to make it harder for skills-based hiring to be successful rather than easier. And then the last thing I'll give you a a practical, some practical tips about how you might be able to dip your toes into skills-based hiring uh, and get started on something that everybody else is talking about. And finally, I'm going to have a little bit of unexpected fun uh, in the presentation as well, which I will leave you hanging on. So, first of all, why, why all the excitement around skills-based hiring. Well, first of all, we all know about the skills shortage, constantly read about it in the newspapers. And that's driven by the massive digitization that's going on in all organizations. And here's a really interesting stat uh, from Indeed in the US. So because of the skills shortage, people are realizing I've got two choices when I'm, I'm going out for a job requisition. Either I go out and try and hire for skills that I know are really in short supply, in which case I'm just going to pay more money and it's going to take forever to hire somebody, or I start thinking about removing some of those qualifications and broadening out my hiring process. And you're seeing that as a trend now. The number of years of experience that people are putting in a role is rapidly declining, partly because there are a lot of new roles out there, and so it makes no sense to go and find an AI analyst and ask for five years experience, because there isn't anybody. So that's one big challenge. And then the other is that there are less and less people with that amount of experience, so you're having to reduce the criteria. So this has been the driver for skills-based hiring. So this now is the promise of, OK, we need to change the way that we hire, we need to move away from experience, and we need to move a bit more to skills. So we have a skills shortage. And now we need to just think about then, okay, how do we find people with the right skills? So this is, this is the, the promise 
of it. And the second thing is we've got a diversity challenge. We know that there are few people with some of those skills, and yet we've all got as organisations a drive to improve our DE and I. So if we open up the talent pools and look for people with less experience, perhaps with less qualifications, then we'll be able to broaden our diversity, equity and inclusion. And then the last thing that uh, skills-based hiring is, is promising to solve is because we've got AI now and we can list out skills, we don't need to worry about experience anymore and we can use AI to help us determine what skills we need and go and find people with those skills. So this is the promise of it. And just to, to give you a couple of stats on this, this is Forrester Research 2024. They went out to 500 companies and said, uh, you know, what are the benefits that you think you'll get from skills-based hiring? 90% said, oh, we'll get uh, a lower cost to hire. 89% said, we'll get a faster time to hire. And 92% said, we will get more diversity. Fantastic. I bet you everybody in this room that's in talent acquisition, if somebody said to you, I can get you a lower cost to hire, faster time to hire, and more diversity, and your life will be so much easier, you'll go, fantastic. Give me the Kool-Aid, point me to that magic wand, and I will take it tomorrow. And that is a little bit what skills-based hiring feels like at the moment, this huge thing that's going to somehow transform our lives. But there are a few things that we need to understand about it. And that's why I like to talk about it a bit, is are we being drawn into the emperor's new clothes on this? What really is skills-based hiring? And I've got five things that uh, if you poke skills-based hiring about, you realise it's not quite as incredible as everybody is referring to it as. First of all, you've got skills matching platforms. Now, some of you in here will be familiar with companies like Eightfold AI, Beamery, who are Manchester-based too. And they will say to you, if you want to introduce skills-based hiring, no problem. You just need to go out to all your employees and find out what skills they've got, ask them to enter into a program, and then suddenly you will now have a complete picture of all the skills in your organisation. Sounds great. But I was talking to one global financial services organisation. They, when they did this process, A, it took them two years to go and ask all the employees to enter in their, their skills. And then secondly, 40,000 skills were then listed for that organisation. 40,000. So how on earth do you now start recruiting based on 40,000 different skills? And this, what you have up on here, this is what an AI-driven skills taxonomy for the role of a recruiter looks like. There are 40 different skills listed here. I'm sure all of them we would feel at some point we touch in our lives as recruiters. But do we need to list all of them? And how on earth are we going to decide which are the ones that are most important if we're going to go out and recruit for that role? So that, that is one big challenge. The second big challenge is what is a skill? And this is one of my favourite topics, and you can certainly come and talk to me afterwards about it. So you've got the Oxford uh, English Dictionary definition of a skill. Practical knowledge in combination with ability. Seems fairly straightforward. But then you ask yourself the question, what's the difference between a soft skill and a hard skill? OK, so if a skill is about ability and a combination of knowledge so that I can think about something as a, an accounting qualification is a hard skill. But is something like communication, is that a skill or is that something that inherently you're good at? Is that something that you can even measure, something that you can even say that somebody is an advanced communicator, you probably can, uh, or somebody is a, a not a great communicator? But then you start thinking about problem solving. Is that a skill or is that just a natural behavioural ability? How quickly do you learn? How quickly do you process information? Are you somebody that has um, good empathy? Is that a skill, something that you can refine, or is that just something you naturally have? So this is big challenge number two. What is your definition of a skill? And you ask 
any, go out and you ask any company out there and they'll give you a different, every one of them will give you a different definition of what a skill is. So how can you introduce skills-based hiring if nobody really knows what a skill is? Then number two, three here on this, AI has now come in and the average uh, life, shelf life of a hard skill is rapidly declining because AI is now automating everything, it's changing everything. So if you think about this as a stat from the World Economic Forum now, nearly 50% of all our core skills are expected to change in the next few years. So why would you go and spend all that time, two years, creating a skills taxonomy if in the next two years, 50% of those skills are going to change? And that the shelf life of a skill is just two and a half years. So again, why would you go down the route of mapping out all your skills if by the time you've done that it's completely out of date. It's like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. By the time you've done it you have to go and start again uh, painting it. And then finally I think it's a really interesting one for McKinsey on this is that they're saying actually social and emotional skills in the AI era are going to be more important than some of the skills we used to value in the past. So Fourth, back to my earlier point about scrapping the CV. The other thing that AI has forced on us now is that you cannot rely on the CV. Now, we know everybody in this room stuck up their hands when I said, do you distrust at least some information in the CV? Well, here's the stat on this. 85% uh, when this survey had found false information on a CV. 60% of people had exaggerated their skills. Now, that was before we even had AI. Now, you have a software application, you can go and look, up, look it up after this, called apply.ai. And what Apply AI will do, take your CV, it will then go out, and you just literally put in project manager, data analyst, it'll then go and find the job description for a data analyst or a project manager. It will then merge your CV with that job description and then using LinkedIn Apply, one-click apply, it'll then apply for the job that's listed on all your sites. And it will do that 5,000 times while you sleep. So it is going to be a tsunami of applications. Some of you, I was talking to somebody earlier here who was just saying LinkedIn messaging now is a total nightmare because they're just getting uh, um, link after link from people saying, here is my capabilities, cover letter, all AI generated. Somebody used the term the other day, sea of sameness. That is, that is what is flooding our, our inboxes. And, and just to bring that to life, this was a, a technology company I was speaking to a, uh, a few months ago. Last year they had 12,000 applications for their roles. Um, it, was, it was a few hundred roles. Um, this year, 45,000 already. A 400% increase. So this is at a time where all of us in this room are facing restrictions on our budgets. We've been told we've got to do more with less. And now we have the AI-enabled candidate who is sending out job applications while they sleep. And we have to do them while we're awake in terms of processing them. So something has got to change around this. And then the last thing is, well, can we rely on psychometric assessments, uh, other tools maybe, rather than CVs to do this screening? Well, ChatGPT has completely destroyed that too. Verbal reasoning, if, if anybody in here is from a law firm, verbal reasoning has been used uh, by law firms for ages as a way of being able to screen out candidates. ChatGPT will do it better than 98% of candidates. And if you think that there are tools out there that stop people using AI for the job application, forget it. The education sector, go and talk to any university and they will tell you that deter and detect in terms of finding out if people are using AI is a complete waste of time. It's not reliable and it's not actually uh, that effective in picking it up. And it's, in fact, we're in an AI arms race where it's easier for the individual to out AI whatever software the universities have got on that. And same for situational judgment tests, if you've ever used those. Anything that is language-based, you can pick up your phone, use ChatGPT to uh, take a picture of the text, and it will give you the right answer to whatever kind of test that you, you're using.
So that is a calculator in every person's hand that everybody can use like a calculator and really easily. So we're going to need a more pragmatic approach to how do we address this. Somebody was saying to me, OK, this is great, Robert. You've now terrified me. Is there a, a solution to this? And there is. But before we go to the solution, we're going to have my moment of a bit of unexpected fun now. So the big thing about Arctic shores is that we believe in understanding people by the way they do something rather than the way that they tell you that they might do something. So now we're going to play a game of rock, paper, scissors. Okay. Now, before I ask you all to stand up and uh, get into position to play rock, paper, scissors, um, I'll just explain some of the rules again again, just in case it's been a while since you were last on the playground and having to play rock, paper, scissors. So, rock, paper, scissors is a zero-sum game. Rock beats scissors, scissors beats paper, paper beats rock. Very, very simple. And we are going to play three rounds. And we're going to, when we get into position, we're going to do it when I say three, so one, two, three, you are then going to reveal what your choice is, okay? Really, really easy. And then at the end of it, after we've played three rounds, I'm going to share with you some of the things that you will have revealed to the person opposite you about your personality from the way that you played rock, paper, scissors, okay? Hopefully you're all up for that now. So please stand up, find somebody uh, that you want to play with. Um, if anybody can't find somebody, stick up your hand. Is there a, okay, is there anybody else? Is there anybody else missing a partner? Yes, over here. So do you want to, do you, would you mind one of you coming around here? Uh, anybody else stick up your hand if you've not got a partner? Okay. Okay, we've got one there. Oh, one over there. Okay, do you want to link up? Okay. All right, everybody, get into position. I don't mind how you do this. So some people like to have it behind their arm. Some people like to wave their arm. Some people just like to reveal. It doesn't matter. So if we could have silence now and get ready for the first one. So, okay, just to remind you again, on my count of three, so when I get to three, you will reveal, all right? On three, not after three, not before three, but on three. Here we go, round one. One, two, three. Okay, remember how you did. Round two, we ready for round two? One, two, three. Like an ice cream. Excellent. Okay. Now we are on round three, the final round. Are you ready? One, two, three. Fantastic. Please, please now sit down. So, first of all, did anybody win all three rounds? Do we have, do we have a rock, paper? Oh, look, we have a couple of rock, paper, scissor champions there. There is, there is an international competition if you feel like uh, entering it. But the, the, the thing that I, I always like to share with people whenever I've done, I do this is just listen to the engagement, just listen to the energy in the room when you're doing something rather than when you say that you might do that something. And that is the point about doing something. You're engaged in something, you will show much more of your natural personality and you will enjoy it and you will get more from it. So let's just reflect then, well, what could we learn about ourselves from the way that we played rock, paper, scissors? So think back to the first round, okay? In the first round, you had no other data point about the other person. So when I said one, two, three, at that point, you are randomly going to select the first of the three options that you've got that you feel happier, 
happiest with. Because you've got no other data point. There's no other reference to that. So you're literally going to select the first one that you feel most comfortable with. Unless, of course, you're a rock, paper, scissors expert and you've already got some sort of tactic around this. But for most people, because it's a zero-sum game, you are going to select what you feel most comfortable with. And here are some of the interesting stats on that. So people who start with rock are much more confident. Oh, I'm, I'm strong. I'm going to start with rock. That's what I feel happiest with. So there's a, there's a level of confidence uh, typically with those people. People who start with paper, much more empathetic. It's a handshake. And it's much more, I like you, and I'm going to start with this. And I feel happiest with this. Scissors. Scissors is an interesting one because scissors is creative. You can make things with that. But also you're cutting something, so there's an edge. There's a strategy piece to how you're doing this as well. So there's a creativity and there's a little bit of an edge uh, to it as well. And then after that point, of course, in the second round, you're all now thinking, if you lost, or even if you won, right, what do I do next? OK, so I started with rock. They started with the scissors. I won. Do I do the same? Do I try paper? Because they may try rock now to repeat me. And you go through all these kind of different things. Ultimately, we know it's a game of chance. But what you end up with, your second choice, again, reflects your personality, how you're going to apply that strategy. And then you have the third option, and you get to the third round. And it's really interesting. People very, very rarely will do the same thing three times in a row because they sort of feel that they need to change. But there are people who do, three, th three, do the same thing three times in a row, and that will reflect their personality. So the point about getting us all to do that is just to remind ourselves that how we can learn about people is so much richer by asking them to do something than asking them to tell us how they might do something. And when we think about jobs and job applications, we spend most of our lives asking people how they might do something rather than actually trying to observe them doing something. So on that note, the thing about Arctic Shores is that we believe in looking at people and thinking about their roots, not their leaves. And I love this analogy. And the reason why I think it's so powerful is, again, why are we stuck with the CV? Because we're obsessed with looking at leaves. If you think of skills as leaves, this is what we've always valued. But if the shelf life of a skill is two and a half years, then the same as it would be for a leaf, it needs to be refreshed. So why would you focus your hiring then on leaves and not roots? And so we at Arctic Shores like to think about uh, people's potential. It's the roots, ultimately, that enable you to acquire skills. And I think of the trunk as experience, the more experience you have, the more you're able to use your roots to then develop more skills. And in this world when things are changing really fast and we don't want to go down the road of massive skills taxonomies, then actually there's a much more simpler approach to skills-based hiring and dealing with the AI challenge is if we start looking at people's roots, which we call skill enablers. And Arctic Shores has then developed a very, very, very simple model based on a lot of research and science on this to say, OK, what are the three roots that will underpin every job that's out there? And when you think about these three roots, thinking style, that's a mixture of do you learn quickly? Do you process information quickly? Do you process information more slowly? Are you a bit more creative? So there's a way that you apply your human intelligence to your role. Then how do you manage? Self-management is so important now. We live in a hybrid world. Some people you know, working all the time from home. Some people in a mixed. So are you sort of person that likes self-direction? Uh, are you somebody who prefers working with, with wider groups? So that self-management of how you organize your day is going to be really important. And finally, we are all people. And the reason we are in organizations is to work with other people. So how well do you interact with people? There are some roles that don't require you to interact with people. That's fine. But there are others that do. But these are, the, we feel, the three fundamental building blocks that if you understand these things about somebody, you will then be able to understand their ability to acquire new skills that you will give them when they come into your organization. And here is my, my practical tip for you. If you want to get into skills-based hiring 
and you want to take a new approach to things, start with the job description. It always amazes me when you ask people in TA, what's the worst thing that happens to you when somebody comes to you with a job requisition, and the answer is, oh, they give me the rubbish job description that they pulled out of a drawer that, that hasn't been looked at for about three years, and they say, well, here's the job description, but actually I just need another John or Sarah, or that's it. And we need to have a better approach to thinking about how we write the job description. And actually, there is a, a much simpler way to doing this, because if you have a job description that's based on experience, then sure enough, the job advert's going to be based on experience, and then the recruitment process is going to be based on experience. So we're never going to scrap the CV. The only way we're going to get around this is if we, as talent acquisition, say that there's a better way to do this job description. Let's completely move away from the old experience-based job description, and can we focus on the core skills, the skill enablers, that are going to drive success for this role. Let's have that discussion. What are the things? Is it problem solving? Is it communicating with others? What are the things that really are going to matter for this person to be successful in this role? And then let's design the job advert and then the interview process to match that. And to give you an example, I did this with Siemens. The managing director came to me and said he was trying to recruit for a role that was open for 200 days. 200 days and just said, if I carry on like this, it's going to kill my business. It was for a project engineer. So Siemens here in Manchester for a project engineer role. I persuaded him to, to go out to market for a no CV job application. He had just focused on attention to detail, um, high discipline, because it was a project uh, engineer type of role, um, and, uh, and, and good learning ability, because he was going to teach them the core Siemens skills that they needed. He ended up recruiting somebody from Aldi, supermarket chain. So this is Siemens, traditional German-English. Actually, Siemens in the UK was set up about the same time as Siemens Germany. But traditional engineering company, recruiting somebody from retail to go into a project engineer role at Siemens. 18 months on, Hannah, it was her name, is absolutely flying at Siemens. And he has now taken this below a managerial opened up all roles to be recruited without a CV because people are wandering around saying I'd like a hammer please and the way to do that is to start focusing on the skill enablers so here's just some things the things that you should do and you, sh you shouldn't do um, around skills based hiring um, you, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll see some of that in, in some of the material as, as well around this but uh, hopefully this has been kind of useful for you as to thinking about things that you, you, you should be focusing on and, and being aware of the challenges around skills-based hiring. Uh, we have got some guides as well. So, uh, you know, a 30-minute presentation in, in, in IHR is, is by no means uh, the only way that you can find out how you can practically implement skills-based hiring. Um, so we do have a stand outside if you want to go and see those, those practical guides that have been developed with the likes of Siemens and Molson Coors. And then finally, if you're not a reading type of person, uh, I mentioned at the beginning um, that I do a podcast. Um, I've spoken to some amazing thought leaders, uh, people like uh, Andrea Marsden, who's up there, who's the global head of talent acquisition and introduced skills-based hiring in a very practical way for VMware. Um, so some, some really, really uh, interesting people who've been pioneering some of these changes. What do you do with the AI-enabled candidate? What's the definition of a skill? Um, they're about 20 to 30 minutes, uh, and they can break up a dog walk uh, or a commute into work uh, sometime. Hope you found that useful. If you'd like to come and ask me some questions afterwards, uh, I'd be very happy to answer any. Thank you for your time.